You stay the same, you never change, and you're as worthy and glory as the day you threw stars into space. You stay the same, and you're as worthy of glory as the day Jesus rose from the grave. You stay the same, and you're as worthy of glory. Called on your name, you stay the same, and you are worthy now and always. You move the mountains, you split the cedars with your voice, you part the waters, you shake the walls till they come down. Stay the same, and you're as worthy of glory as the day I first called on your name. You stay the same, and you are worthy now and always. You move the mountains, you split the cedars with your voice, you part the waters, you shake the walls and
Zion has moved from a place to our hearts Heaven is where you've seated us Your dwelling place is now here in our hearts In spirit we worship, in truth we will worship Zion has moved from a place to our hearts Heaven is where you've seated us Your dwelling place is now here in our hearts In spirit we worship, in truth we will worship Zion has moved from a place to our hearts Heaven is where you
Cause there's nothing we want more 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 Feels 
Just like you breathed your breath of life into Adam, Lord, I come alive. We come alive. We come alive, oh God. We come alive as we breathe in your breath of life. We breathe in your breath of life, we come alive, we come alive, we come alive, as we breathe in your breath of life, oh God. In Garamandra Makandre Bam 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 Baba Yangre Bakandre Bakandro. As we breathe in your breath of life, we come alive in you, Lord. We come alive in you, Lord. Oh, we speak to the dry bones. Oh, come alive, come alive. Dead bones rise. season at the moment where the enemy is just boasting over us, just saying, we're done, we're defeated. And when, when the Lord spoke to Ezekiel, he said to him, Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? Ezekiel said, surely you know, Lord, surely you know. And then the Lord said to Ezekiel, prophesy over these dry bones, prophesy over these dead bones. Everything holding us back, everything holding us back, everything holding us back from freedom. As we prophesy. 
aside today and just keep declaring this, we will start to see a shift of atmosphere. A shift of atmosphere. Prophesy to these dead bones, come alive, come alive. We prophesy to these dead bones, come alive, come alive. No matter what it is, no matter what it is. Oh, we weren't created to live a defeated life. We weren't created to live a defeated life. We weren't created. Prophesy, come alive, come alive. We cling to the cross and the one and gave his life for us. We cling to the cross and the one and paid it all for us. Cling to the cross and the one who gave his life for us. Cling to the cross and the one who paid it all for us. going to share a few thoughts as we continue our worship by coming to communion. And I, I say that deliberately because the, you know, we know the worship's not just the musical part. We are continuing that with our communion, with our giving, with our gathering, with our fellowship. All of that is, is part of our worship. Um, as I've been pondering communion this week, and, and it is something I've, I think I've talked about here before, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that Jesus gets us to, well, the physical side of what we do in communion involves consuming something, involves actually taking it into our bodies where we are most vulnerable. You know, a lot of the stuff around COVID has been about obviously being transmissible by it getting into our system. And so we cover our mouths or our nose or even, you know, outside of those times where we sneeze or cough or, you know, all of that stuff. Poisons going in our body, this is where we're most vulnerable, but also this is where we are nourished from the food that we eat. You know, you've probably heard things like, you are what you eat, and, and people saying things like, you know, food is your medicine and things like that, you know, about healthy eating and all these sorts of things. And I find it really striking that of all of the different ways that Jesus could have got us to commemorate and take part in his death and resurrection in some way, in some symbolic act, in some prophetic act, in some physical way, he's gone with food and drink because it's something that gets inside of us. And I think there's, you know, there's obviously, we could ponder that for a long time and have many different reasons as to why that's the case. But I think it's really powerful. Um, We know this side of the covenant that we are where God lives 
in the temple, in the Old Testament temple, there are all sorts of ways that they would remember that and they would have bread in the temple and there were, I'm not going to get into it all, but there were reasons why the bread in the temple was a big deal and sacrifices and, you know, an ark and seraphim and all these diff- different things that symbolise, you know, all sorts of incredible aspects of God and, and all of that. And God's making a really powerful statement by us taking Jesus' body and blood into our bodies embodying the fact that we are the temple. We are where God lives. And, and as I was pondering this um, a couple of weeks ago, actually, and I talked about it with Rach and with some other people, you can think about that in a lot of ways, but uh, your body is a house of worship. You are a house of worship. It might seem a weird way to say it, but you're a cathedral with skin on. You're, you're a walking cathedral. You're an ark of his glory. You're a temple. Any, you know, we, we've, we've heard phrases like a temple of the Holy Spirit. I just think sometimes it's healthy to put different language on it just to make us think about it in a different way. That is, you know, you, you might have heard if you grew up in a liturgical church, the term sacred space. You are sacred space. Your body is sacred space. You know, it's something really powerful that Jesus has done. And it's not because of what we've done. We know that. It's because of what, Jesus has done for us. And we take that into our bodies. And I'm just so reminded and and, and it affects so many aspects of my life that this is a temple. And I don't mean that in the sense of like, so better not have too many meat pies. Although, I mean, maybe that helps too, I guess, for being healthy. But more importantly, this is where God lives. He's chosen to live here. We've been talking to the kids about this a lot lately. Like Jesus is in there and Judah's going, where's he fit? You know, well, it's a bit different than that. But this is where God lives. He has chosen to dwell in you. And I think communion is a really, really powerful way that we can participate in that and be reminded of that and and embody that. So as you take communion today, I just wanted to suggest you can do whatever you want. But I just wanted to suggest maybe consider one way that if you really grasped the fact that God is in you, living in you, what's one thing that that changes? What, what does that change for you? Something where, like we know it, but if we really knew it, if we really were aware of that, what's one thing that that would, that would impact, that would change? I just encourage you to bring that to Jesus as you take communion. And say, Lord, help me with that. Pour out your grace and help me to really be and and know that I'm a cathedral with skin on. I'm a house of worship. Um, So we'll just come and take our bread and take our juice and spend a little time with Jesus. to be with you Rachel when you came in tonight um, I saw you coming out of a huge hotel like you'd see in a DC comic very 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 modern and you came out you you went in the revolving door and you came out changed 
And I said to the Lord, what is the change? And he said that he is restoring to you stolen time. And there's been so much time stolen off you. And some of it's been quite deliberate and very unkind. And, uh, and God is going to show you in no uncertain terms that every, every tear you cried has been captured by him and he is replacing all the stolen months, years, emotions. And there's also like a financial windfall coming because some of it included money that was stolen from you. Okay. Um, it's so good to be here, really. Everything's the same. Matty's there with his feet exposed to the whole world. Um, I want to talk about the love of God tonight. And uh, and one of the things about when you talk about the love of God is everyone nods their head as if they know everything about the love of God, which of course they don't. So, But um, <clears throat> finally, the rock on which you'll crash and sink will be the love of God. There is just... No answer and no comparison. Um, I went um, this week, one of my dear old friends passed away and uh, I was in business with him and uh, we made a lot of money together. But the more money I made, the more I knew I wasn't meant to be in the business. The more money we made, the more money he wanted. And so I've seen him over years since I have not been in the business make a lot of money. But he, um, and, uh, he came to lots of Christian events with me. And in fact, at a conference that I was part of, he came and operated the video camera um, filming a lady that had risen from the dead, an Indian lady. A lot of these things impacted him and he always was going to make a decision sometime. But this week uh, he had been drinking too much. He fell down the stairs and hit his head and died. And all the promises, all, all the plans that he had that he'd outlined to me he had one of his sons in the business, another son in the army. He had all these plans and everything that was going to happen. But those plans won't come to anything now. And you know when you know people, they come so close to that commitment where they fall into the heart of God and never get out. And... Uh, or those who skirt round the, cir the circle of um, the edge of commitment. And I want to talk um, about the love of God as a force that now is being unleashed in the world. I'm amazed, beloved, we live in an age where our government, if they can find something else to make us afraid of, they're going to serve it up to us. I just cannot believe it. Now... We've all got to be paranoid about having a Chinese dinner, don't we? I don't know what the story is. Now, we're, now China is our big adversary. And I'm, I don't understand um, international politics, but I understand you know, the, part, the, the role of a government is to bring its people to a place of peace and rest. And when it doesn't do that, things go wrong. And so we're here tonight, we're in our last night of Mass Sunday. Um, and and uh, at the same time, you have all these sorts of things, they, they all percolate around your life, right? So we didn't know when we're going to have to leave this building. We don't know. Uh, the council doesn't know either because every time they come up with an idea, the local community give them a petition and they've got to cancel the idea. But 
I want to tell you what saved us this week. The government inadvertently bulldozed the nest of a long-necked tortoise down the bottom here, killed the tortoise, gave up his life. Uh, They found lots of eggs that were all infertile in the nest. And so now they've closed this down while they sort out the case of the long-necked tortoise. And you sort of think to yourself, do you ever feel like you're going crazy? You've got all this stuff happening around you. Yet God is the true anchor of our heart. You've got to anchor your heart with God. Because otherwise, you'll allow the very um, the, the, the pressure of living to rob you of what God wants you to have. In Romans chapter 8, it says, The whole of creation waits in eager anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. That's you and me. Creation is crying out saying, where are the sons of God? Where are they? Not only where are they, what are they doing about their sonship? What are they doing about the authority that I've given them to walk in? What are they doing about it? Surely they're not just going to church. Surely they're, the sure, surely they're doing more than that. As Romans 8 says, For we know the whole of creation has been groaning together in labour, like in labour pain, saying, Where are the sons of God? Every dog, every frog, every log, all crying out, Go to the sons of God. All of creation. Everything from long necked tortoises, tortoises to blue whales crying out, Where are the sons of God? And in the in the situation we find ourselves, we find ourselves where we can, as Christian people, live in a permanent state of um, unconnectedness to the world, unconnectedness to what God's saying, unconnectedness to our destiny. Like, what are you doing here? My mate Glenn wasn't planning on falling down the stairs and killing himself. He wasn't planning on dying. That wasn't in his plan. He had a five-year, a 10-year and a 15-year for his plan, for his life. He'd been to um, various professionals to help him plan his life and help him administer his money and all of that. But, and so he wasn't planning on exiting the equation, but he did. And we're, we're waiting And the whole world is waiting for us to stand up and be the sons that we're called to be. And sons and daughters of God are those who know what to say no to and what to say yes to. And they live their life because God is searching the world looking for himself in us. We are meant to be carriers of his presence. So if I meet Susie Perkins, I must be able to sense in her some of the divine so that I can say she's indeed a daughter of God. She's one that creation is crying out to see. Yet I think that we have become afraid to be identified as sons and daughters of God. We think that somehow it's not relevant. And we think that somehow we don't carry what we're meant to. See, Bob, we live in a world where the spiritual world runs parallel to us. 
and the, the real world, the, the invisible world, which is the real world, because my friend Glenn was a catcher, was a, um, was a collector of BMW cars. If you're going to collect the car, it might as well be a good one. And so he, he had several cars. He also had a Cadillac. But you know what? At the funeral home on Thursday, none of them are going in the coffin. There will not be one Cadillac and there will not be one BMW. They'll just be him in the clothes that his parents dropped off for him to wear. And we can live our life not realising the potential that we have or what it, means to be, what it means to be a son or daughter of God. This parallel universe where God wants us to be able to sense the invisible in the visible living of our life. In reading and, uh, and studying the Word of God, which um, is really just beautiful. And the book of Ephesians tells us that everything, that God, what God wanted to give us, he's already given us. We've already got it. It's there. And in, in doing what God wants us to do in this parallel universe, we live in this dualism of life where it says that we are seated at the right hand of God. So I'm sitting here, but I'm also seated at the right hand of God. I'm in two positions at once. I'm in the divine position, seated at the right hand of God. And uh, when I came to God, I, I, I was overwhelmed by his love. And what I have learned that really over the years, your prayer life changes. So that my prayer life is not a great shopping list. My prayer life is a great thank you and worship list. So my life centres around the worship of God, the acknowledgement of the divine, the acknowledgement. When we go to Bathurst and we see a little new granddaughter, just a week old, Ophelia, and there she is, perfect in every way. And we see our other little granddaughter, Aurelia, telling us all day and giving us instructions about how we should be looking after Ophelia. And so, which is not Ophelia, it's her, my Ophelia, my Ophelia, my Ophelia, like that. And in seeing the wonder and the beauty of that, in my own walk with God, I, I, I ask him about these big questions. What does it mean to be part of creation crying out for the manifestation of the sun? What does it mean? And I was reading from the, from the book of Revelations about walking, about the sea of glass. And I, I said to God, this sea of glass must be magnificent. And I found myself walking on the sea of glass. And the Bible tells us that once we have seen something in God, we've got it. It's ours. You know when you see the big advertising signs which say, unsee this? Well, when you see things in God, you can't unsee them. You've seen them. They belong to you. They change the very fabric and fibre of your life. And... I get amazed because when I'm thinking about my friend Glenn, 
as strange as this might seem, if I had been there, I would have prayed for him to resurrect. Because in my heart to do that. Because I have seen someone come back. So I've seen one person come back. And uh, I haven't all prayed with all that many dead ones that come back. So if you, something happened to you tonight, we'd at least have a go at getting you back. Right. We'd be calling you back into your body. Because you see, can't you, can't you see, or I hope you can see, that the very creative power of God is living in us Crying out, the very world crying out for the manifestation of the sons of God. For us to be seen, for us to walk among people. And we're created in the likeness of God. When you get to heaven, you'll you'll, you'll, um, recognise Jesus because... You're created in his image. There's something of him in you. And I know that's mysterious and not easy to understand, but you'll, you'll, you'll recognise him and he'll recognise you. And you'll hear the, hear the words, we trust, well done, good and faithful servant. And you'll know that he's talking to you. And though we fell into sin, and though we took that divine image of God and we marred it and damaged it, still it could not destroy the image of God that we have been made in. And we're there to carry his image always joining him at the end in the marriage feast of the Lamb. The marriage feast of the Lamb. No matter how nice your dog is, don't get too attached. You won't be marrying the dog. You're marrying the Holy Lamb of God. See, ancient empires, the rulers of ancient empires, the Greeks and the Romans, they glorified themselves by making statues of themselves. So everywhere you went, if you uh, turned up at Roman, uh, in Roman Britain, there'd be statues of Caesar there. And they, they got smart, smart after the centuries. They could make them with detachable heads. So um, when there was a change of Caesar, you'd get a new head on your Caesar. So he'd get a new head. And so that, so that you'd be able to say, I know, it's, I know what Caesar's like. I know what Caligula looks like. I know what Nero is like. I know what Julius Caesar is like because you've got a statue with their head on it. So no matter how far you got away from Rome, you always knew what Caesar looked like. And so many of the leaders in the ancient world declared themselves to be God, didn't they? The prophet Daniel is taken away to Babylon and he serves four kings. He serves Nebuchadnezzar, he serves Nebuchadnezzar's son and he serves the two Persian kings, Cyrus and... No, Darius wasn't a king. Um... He served the two, the two Persian kings. And so he's there. And finally people conspire against him. And the emperor brings out, the emperor brings out an edict that 
you, he's going to be God and worship by God, like God for 30 days. And you're not allowed to pray to anyone else. And he marked it with his seal. Too late. He didn't, he realised that he'd been manoeuvred, but he couldn't do anything about it. Um, so he said that he said to Daniel, "You've got to go on the lion's den." And as he put Daniel in the lion's den, he was heartbroken, and he sealed a stone over the lion's den and sealed it with his ring. And he stayed up all night fasting for Daniel to survive. Now, Bob, Daniel was 93 when he went into the lion's den. Some say that's the reason the lions never ate him. (laughs) 93 years old and opened his windows three times a day to praise God and couldn't care who heard him. There's a son of God. There's a son of God. And when, um, when the king opened the lion's den and found Daniel alive, he was so joyful that he took all Daniel's accusers and threw them into the lion's den. And if you read that story, their feet never hit the ground. They must have been much younger than 93 anyway. The reality is We can't think that we're going to live our life without having our faith challenged. Today, I'm watching the telly and it's got the film of a women's swimming event in America that was won by a man. And he won the event because he said, I identify with being a woman. So he identified with being a woman. He wins the women's swimming event. Now, not only that, he nearly lapped the field. Now, he he was a male swimmer who never won an event. So he used his physical advantage to call himself a woman. I'm not saying he doesn't have all other, other all sorts of problems. But do you think the world's a bit crazy? It's got to be crazy, isn't it? Because he's not allowed to change in the change room where the women change. But he's allowed to swim in the women's events. And I, I say the sons of God got to rise up and appear. And they've got to do it with a lot of love and a lot of concern and a lot of compassion. And I think as, uh, as the Church of Jesus Christ, we have not always handled differences in people with very much love and concern. It says in 1 John 4, 18, for we are as he is in the world. There are people all over the world camping out, crying out. And they're saying, will someone deliver me from this corrupt system I'm living under? So, again, today, I was watching the news this morning and... uh, Mounted police in Canada ran over a woman in a mobility scooter. And then they denied doing it, even though the mangled mobility scooter was there and it was on film. And uh, you sort of say to yourself, let the sons and daughters of God arise. The world must be overcome by a revolution of extreme kindness and sacrifice. We have to be carriers of his presence.
We've been placed here on purpose. You know, if you listen to your um, critics, you'll lose the incredible joy and privilege of your salvation. In going to Glenn's funeral, it will be a sad day. But it will also be in some ways a very joyful day for me as I remember that I with him was offered a choice and I made a better choice um, through God's help and grace. We're told that the joy of the Lord is my strength. And Psalm 51 says, in his presence is the fullness of joy. We carry his presence when we live with a heart that's sensitive to him. When we live, if you like, straddling Bob two worlds, the invisible and the visible. And we are meant to be a bridge. We are bri- a bridge to the supernatural. Because we can pull things from the invisible world into the visible. We know who we are and we know this pandemic has taught us that we're a lot tougher than we think we are. We, as Robbie talked tonight, you know, Jesus is the mediator, mediator of a new covenant. So when we receive communion, we are receiving the evidence of a new covenant, a new way of doing business that saved us the dilemma and the challenge of standing in a temple up to our knees in blood as animals are sacrificed to make up for the pain of our sin. And to the sprinkling of blood that speaks of a better thing than the blood of Abel. Cain and Abel, brothers. Cain kills his brother Abel. And it says that the blood of Abel cried out from the ground, crying out, Cain, you were meant to love me, yet you killed me. Our relationship was not meant to be like this. Me dead and all my potential dead with me. As it says in 1 John, as you walk in the light... As he is in the light, we fellow, our fellowship with one another, our fellowship, our shared reality, the life we live together, what we have in common. And the blood of Jesus is continually cleansing us from all sin. Everything that stops us accepting the invocation to live in the glory of God. God constantly is asking me, how far am I prepared to go? How far am I prepared to go? What am I prepared to give God? When I first became a Christian the very first week, an old priest said to me this, he said, your God will be where you spend your time and your money. And you know what? It's still true. So you've got to be asking yourself where are you spending your time and where are you spending your money? As the Bible says, there's a way that seems right to a man but it leads to destruction. My friend Glenn came from Sri Lanka and he went to a very, very good school there called Wellesley College. And 
on the internet are pages of well wishes of former students of Wellesley College saying, rest in peace, Glenn, rest in peace, Glenn, rest in peace, Glenn, rest in peace. And we like the sound of that. We, we do like that, you know. But we don't know if he's resting in peace, do we? We don't know. But you can know, and you can know tonight, that if you were to check out tonight, check out early, you'd have a hall pass to heaven and you could know. Because Jesus died to bridge the unseen spiritual world and the natural world we live in. I pray for you and I pray for myself. I pray that you would walk in the reality of being the resurrected sons and daughters of God. That you would hear the groaning of creation within you. That you would feel with every fibre of your being creation crying out on the inside of you saying, I am a son, I am a daughter. I will manifest among the people. I pray for your bodies. I pray for health in your bodies now. I pray for health in your mind. I pray for your family, for all broken relationships in their family, that they, they would come to a place of peace and rest. I thank God with all my heart for you, for the members of this congregation, how kind they've been to me over the years. How they've put up with my crazy idiosyncrasies. I, I just thank God for you. I pray that the Lord that adds riches and brings no sorrow would minister in the depths of your being. Amen. Rick, you know, you have plans for your life, but the bigger plan is yet to come. What you're doing now is not what you're going to be doing, and what you're doing now, has, uh, compared to what you're going to be doing, what you're going to be doing hasn't even been invented. So that's why it's hard for you to hold if it's a new thing. And God's birthing something new in you, and he wants you to have enough ticker to do it, you know, that he, he's going to give you the strength to do it, because it's away from what you're used to. Be blessed in his name. Uh, could I please have Michael up here? And I want Michael and I want um, Libby to pray with Rick's leg. He's had an operation. He's got some plates in it. 